Okay, hello everyone. Um, um, yes, I do hope to get the second paper back tomorrow. Um, um, I think Donovan said he could do that and I'm basically done with mine, so hopefully that will happen. Um, are there questions about the uh, final paper assignment that I went over last time? Okay. Um, oh, and I didn't bring my... Um, so I'm going, I'm going to start by, um, by going into a bunch of stuff that I didn't get to at the end last time about barbarism and so forth, partly because I feel like my thoughts on the new reading are not very settled. I will talk about it. Uh, um, this is this is the first reading that I didn't assign last time I taught the course, so I'm kind of trying to prepare it for the first time. And I, um, well, we'll see when I get to that. Um, uh, what I can say about it when I can't, but um, um, but. That's okay because there was a lot of stuff left over last time that I wanted to talk about. So I'm going to start with that. Um, so, um, okay, so remember uh, um, last time, well, let me, I guess, first write the history of civilization from last time. State of nature, barbarism, partial civilization, and then last time I think I wrote full civilization, but I realized she actually calls it true civilization. I, I mean, I don't think it makes any difference what you say, but. Right where the state we're in now is this, partial civilization. <laughs> so, and I said that according to her, partial civilization is a state of artificiality, uh, falseness, um, um, deception, including especially self-deception. Oh, Vanessa says, I think you wrote Best Society last time. That was a different list. There were two lists of four things last time. One of them was the li this list of stages. The other was the list of um, first principles. Right? And the last thing on the list of first principles was that the best society is the one that's founded in human nature. Right? So I just wrote Best Society rather than writing all that. Yeah, okay. Um, However, to answer your question, it is the same thing, yes, right? That is, the true civilization would be the best society, and therefore it would be the one that was founded in human nature. Um, I mean, uh, the new reading says a lot more about what human nature is actually not like. That's what I want to talk about, but what I feel I don't have settled in my mind is what 
is important there, and in particular, exactly what does she disagree with Hobbes, especially with Hobbes about? One thing I'm really realizing is in some way Hobbes of the other three people is the one that she's closest to, strangely, even though the conclusions they reach are kind of opposite. Um, but any case, sorry, so getting back to this. So, so um, right, so this is a state of, of deception and of self-deception. Um, and she also describes, I think, a, a metaphor for the same thing as this foggy atmosphere, right? Remember she said that Rousseau uh, disdained to breathe the foggy atmosphere. Um, and apparently the idea is that because he disdained to breathe it, he couldn't stay with it long enough to see through it. Um, if he had stayed with it long enough, he would have understood what it, what's really going on, and he would have seen through it to the this uh, future that could come out of it. Um, okay, so um, which just makes me think of something that I didn't think of before. But anyway, I'll keep that in mind for the for later on in the lecture. Um, so, um, um, so the question I want to talk about now is uh, what, what generates this foggy atmosphere, right? That is, why is the state of partial civilization a state of falseness and deception and self-deception? Um, and um, I think Wollstonecraft's answer is that the way this state arises out of barbarism um, necessarily creates an, um, an interest in hiding those first principles. Um, and it's, it's a class interest in hiding them. So, um, so to understand why I want to go back and say a little bit, I mean, um, in a sense, I think I already said enough about it last week to explain this, but, um, but in a sense I didn't. So, um, so let me say more about what this stage of barbarism is like, according to her. Um, so she's, according to Wollstonecraft, this is the state that Rousseau thought was second best compared to the state of nature. Now, um, there's a couple things that she could have in mind in saying that. Um, she could be thinking of that savage state from the discourse on inequality. But actually, Rousseau didn't say that was second best. He said that was best. <laughs> Right. So, I mean, um, and like I said before, she she seems to ignore that. I think most people who talk about Rousseau ignore that, that he doesn't actually think that the original state of nature was the best state for human beings. So but she doesn't say anything about that. Um, so I think what she has in mind is um, the. Um, that she's saying that Rousseau thinks is second best is the situation of Sparta, as discussed. It's discussed in the first discourse, um, and also in the social contract, especially. Um, or you know, I have to say is, or in the social contract, especially, it's associated with the, also associated with the Roman Republic. Right? I mean, the, actually, the part of the social contract we skipped was a detailed description of the institutions of the Roman Republic and why they made it such a great uh, place. Um, so, um, so, Wollstonecraft 
However, uh, when she refers to this, um, refers to a patch passage in the first discourse that we didn't read. So this is on page um, 14. Now what's going on? It's not. I'm going to have to unplug and plug this one back in too. And now something happened to the camera that's on me too. The camera is busy. Ah, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so page 14, back in chapter 1. Um, she, she talks about Rousseau. Maybe there, there was no point in showing you this in the book. I'm just going to read a few words now. Um, Apostrophizing the shade of Fabricius. That's that's the only thing, or Fabricius, I guess. Uh, um, that was the only thing I wanted to read for the moment from, from Wollstonecraft. So she's referring to, so uh, Fabricius was a um, famous general from the time of the Roman Republic. Um, and... Um, Rousseau uh, um, imagines bringing Fabricius back to show him uh, the empire. So um, to show him the sophisticated uh, city of Rome that's the capital of the world and that's no longer a republic that now lives under an emperor. Um, and uh, what he imagines Frambricius saying, among other things, is, uh, and I'll just, this is a quote from, like I said, it's in the f first discourse. So this is on page 12 of the basic political writings. If you have that book, it's in the same book. Romans, make haste to tear down these amphitheaters, shatter these marbles, burn these paintings, drive out these slaves who subjugate you and whose fatal arts corrupt you. Let others achieve notoriety by vain talents. The only talent worthy of Rome is that of conquering the world and making virtue reign in it. That's what Rousseau imagines the shade of Fabricius saying when he comes back. So the, so the idea here is that um, Fabricius represents this good state. Um, so I'm going to say, like, according to... to um, Wollstonecraft, Sparta, and the Roman Republic are perfect examples of this state of barbarism. Whereas, and was Rousseau thinks that state is pretty good. Now, I mean, I suggested actually Rousseau may think that Sparta is better than anything in the state of nature. But I, it's it's certainly reasonable to think, you know, to interpret it to mean, no, it's second best. It would be better if you could stay in the state of nature. But if you have to have a commonwealth, this would be the best way to do it. Um, so, um, um, so Wollstonecraft's response 
And that's, I mean, I had to read you that passage from Rousseau to make sense of what she says next, because she just assumes you know what Rousseau says there and then responds to it. Um, um, yeah, I guess I could have read from the beginning of that paragraph. Oh, and I see Alvaro has already quoted the entire relevant passage. <laughs> Very good. So, right, so starting from the beginning of the paragraph. Um, but true to his first position, next to the state of nature, Rousseau celebrates barbarism. How is this? That's our focus. Ugh. And apostrophizing the shade of Fabricius, he forgets that, in conquering the world, the Romans never dreamed of establishing their own liberty on a firm basis, or of extending the reign of virtue. Right? So he's thinking about that. She, I'm sorry, she's thinking about that last thing that Rousseau has Fabricius say. The last thing he says is the only virtue... The, or, um, the only talent worthy of Rome is that of conquering the world and making virtue uh, reign in it. And her response is, he forgets that, the Ro yes, the Romans were very, the Roman Republic was very into conquering the world, but they didn't dream of either securing their own liberty or extending the reign of virtue. So... Um, in other words, um, uh, the Roman Republic was not really either free or virtuous in the way a truly civilized state would be. It was just kind of free by accident, and they were only virtuous among themselves. Um, right? They, they had a certain again, kind of accidental virtue, not based on knowledge. Um, they had some institutions which, you know, made them freer than other people within their own city. But, um, but uh, without the kind of um, knowledge and uh, use of reason that would lead us to build the true civilization, uh, that well, all that re resulted in was, um, uh, on the one hand, that the violence that characterizes the state of barbarism was just turned outwards to conquer the world, and not to conquer the world to make it virtuous, right? That is, the Romans didn't try to set up little Roman republics wherever they went. Even at the time of the Republic, you know, Rome was a republic, but it ruled all the other provinces as an empire, basically. So, um, um, and she uh, alludes to something similar with the Spartans. So she, um, she alludes to the fact so first of all, this was something that I didn't have time to get into too much with Rousseau, but, you know, um, um, in ancient Sparta, there were actually two completely different classes of people, um, or in ancient Lacedaemonia is actually the name of the place. The Spartans were the free people who... Um, uh, you know, had all these great institutions that um, that everyone talks about so much, but most people were helots, right? So they were the Spartans and the helots. And the helots were slaves, <laughs> and they were the ones who did all the agriculture and um, uh, and so forth. And um, so uh, 
you know, I mean, Rousseau does recognize this. He says basically that Sparta, that is the society of the Spartans themselves, was this wonderful free uh, society, but um, it's just uh, um, that was the limit of the Commonwealth, and the Helots were outside of it. Um, and this wonderful free city just ruled over all the helots as slaves. And he says, was that justified? Well, no, I just said slavery can never be justified, but, you know, maybe it was necessary or something. It's something very evasive. In any case, um, what, what Wollstonecraft alludes to is that supposedly there was the following custom that they would make the helots fight for them too. And if one of the helots showed particular bravery in protecting the Spartans in battle, they would give them a special award. And the special award was like a signal to for like secret death squads to kill them when no one was looking. <laughs> because they didn't want any brave helots, <laughs> um, right? So Wollstonecraft says, like, uh, you know, um, people who have a custom like that can't be called virtuous. Um, so, um, so, you know, this, in opposition to Rousseau, Wollstonecraft says, look, these, these states were, were, these states that you like so much were states of violence, slavery, um, the exact opposite of virtue. Um, and it seems that, although, again, she doesn't say very much about the state of nature. She doesn't really describe it in detail, but it seems like, if anything, she thinks this is worse, right? That the, the, the things got, um, that, that, you know, she may agree with Locke, basically, that the original state of nature was relatively peaceful. It wasn't solitary. Um, but um, when we get to this stage, uh, all hell breaks loose. Now, I mean, remember Rousseau in the second discourse, I mean, this is what again, makes this kind of comparison so complicated. Rousseau in the second discourse basically says the exact same thing, right? This Rousseau in the second discourse um, says that, uh, you know, I mean, the original state of nature was solitary, and that was not so good, although it's not as bad as Hobbes thought it was. Then there was this savage state, which wasn't bad at all, and that you know, seems like it's similar to what Wollstonecraft thinks the state of nature was like. People were living in small families, you know, there weren't large-scale conflicts. Um, uh, you know, women didn't have to carry the babies around with them and hunt while they nursed. They could send their husbands out to do that. Um, so uh, um, that all sounds like the, the state that Rousseau likes. And then remember that in Rousseau's general history of the world in the second discourse, what happens after that is the war of the rich against the poor. So it's basically exactly this kind of situation, this violent aristocracy um, uh, and, uh, you know, um, they're not forced exactly, but they're kind of tricked into starting a commonwealth where the like powerful rich people will control them. Um, so, I, um, so really only arguing about whether Sparta and or the Roman Republic were an exception to this pattern, I think. But, but nevertheless, that could be a very important argument, right? Especially if it's true that the social contract is basically about how to set up a new Sparta or Roman Republic. 
right? Like that's the model that Rousseau sets for himself in his positive political philosophy. Um, so that would, um, so arguing about these particular cases would still be very important. Okay, well, um, so, um, um, so in any case, uh, Wollstonecraft thinks this situation is terrible. Um, she, she seems to think it may be a necessary stage, um, but, uh, you know, that we have to go through, but, um, but the main point is to get out of that stage as quickly as possible and into something else. And what we get to when we leave that stage is the state of partial civilization. So, um, I mean, Rousseau... Well, Rousseau definitely thinks that if we go from the Roman Republic to this state, right, and since this is the state of civilization we have now, this is the one that Rousseau rejects, right? As when Rousseau says in the first discourse that civilization is not good for people, or in the second discourse that, um, you know, the inequalities in uh, civilization make it, uh, worse than the state of nature and make and are, are unjustified. Um, so he's talking about what Wollstonecraft is calling the state of partial civilization. Um, so Wollstonecraft, you know, I mean, she agrees with Rousseau that when we enter this stage, there's new vices come about that weren't found in the in the barbaric state. Um, but nevertheless, her general criticism of Rousseau on this point, and this is again back on page 14, is, um, that Rousseau, right, disgusted with artificial manners and virtues, that again is what characterizes the state of partial civilization, the citizen of Geneva, instead of properly uh, sifting the subject, threw away the wheat with the chaff, without waiting to inquire whether the evils which his ardent, um, which, sorry, I can't read from down there, whether the evils which his ardent soul turned from indignantly were the consequences of civilization, or the vestiges of barbarism. So obviously she's so I mean Rousseau thinks they're consequences of civilization. Obviously she's going to say no, they're vestiges of barbarism. Now, how do those two things I just said go together, though? They seem contradictory, right? That is, on the one hand, she says the evils in this state are ve are vestiges of barbarism, but on the other hand, she agrees with Rousseau that the, there's new vices that come about in this state that didn't exist in the state of barbarism. And I mean, we basically know what those are, this kind of artificiality and deceptiveness. So how can those be both new in this state and vestiges of barbarism? Um, So, um, well, so the way these um, things result from barbarism is, first of all, this. Um, this is continuing the same passage I was reading from before. He saw vice tramping on virtue and the semblance of goodness taking place of the reality. He saw talents bent by power to sinister purposes and never thought of tracing the gigantic mischief up to arbitrary power, up to the hereditary distinctions that clash with the mental superiority that naturally raises a man above his fellows. 
So the mental superiority that naturally raises a man above his fellows, if you remember, one of her first principles uh, was that um, the only thing that raises one being enough above another is virtue. So the mental superiority here, she doesn't mean like uh, intelligence merely in the sense of cleverness or something like that. She means um, um, the kind of mental superiority that results in virtue. Um, that's what actually raises one person above another. But we've inherited from barbarism a different system of raising one person above another. Hereditary distinctions. Um, so, uh, where do hereditary distinctions figure into these barbaric uh, republics? Well, I, I mean, it's easy to see in the case of Sparta, right? Like, um, the Spartans didn't really have hereditary distinctions of rank among themselves, but there was a hereditary distinction between them and everyone else, which they maintained by force and fraud. Um, so, um, so uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly where she would put that in the Roman Republic, except, uh, uh, again, you know, um, not everyone was a Roman citizen. Um, and well, and uh, although Rousseau implies that slavery was an invention of the empire, that's not true. They had slaves in the Republic as well. Um, and that is, they had hereditary slavery. Um, so, uh, um, so I think she's within her rights to say these are examples of the way these artificial hereditary distinctions get passed down from their vestiges of barbarism. But um, um, the, the new vices of deception and artificiality arise because, um, because we've left the state of barbarism. But we still have these vestiges of it left behind. So what does that mean? Well, um, it means that these basically barbaric institutions, like monarchy, slavery, um, the military, um, the church, meaning the Anglican church, when she talks about this, um, these, these are um, institutions in which people hold arbitrary power over others for heredity because based on heredity or wealth or for other reasons um, and um, in the state of barbarism they uh, openly held on to that arbitrary power by force so what happens in the state of partial civilization is that um, um, it's no longer possible to openly hold on to this. It's no longer possible to say, you know, why, if, if I ask, why are you the king and I'm not, you can't just say, well, because the army supports me, not you, <laughs> right? You have to pretend you have a right to it. And that's where the foggy atmosphere gets generated. And that's why I said it's a class interest, right? The people who are on top gain an interest in falsifying things because the open, honest truth about the way things work uh, would no longer be swallowed, um, right? So she says this, I think, most clearly on page 17, that can't be right, 17, oh no, yeah, it is right, okay, I'm sorry, I was looking at page 37. Um, Uh, 
thus, as wars, agriculture, commerce, and literature expand the mind, despots are compelled um, to make covert corruption hold fast the power which was formerly snatched by open force. So that's what she claims Rousseau didn't understand about this transition. Now again, I mean, in the second discourse, he does kind of seem to agree with her about that transition, right? That again, if you, if you forget about Sparta and the Roman Republic for a second, right? Like the way, um, I mean, maybe the dividing line isn't exactly the same stage, but, but you know, the, um, there's a trick that the rich people use in founding civilization to make the poor people uh, go along with it. Um, so, but again, I guess the question about this exception is key. Right? That is, the question is, um, um, was there a way to do it either with, without either arbitrary power uh, openly held or fraud and artificiality and deception? So Rousseau says, yes, it's not very easy, but here's some examples of where it was possible. But she says... No, 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 you're forgetting <laughs> that it wasn't possible in those cases either. Um, you're, you're conveniently forgetting that, you know, I mean, look, it's the way Rousseau, I, I'm sorry I didn't get a time, time to talk about this when I lectured about Rousseau either, but um, I mean, it, it goes together with his view about this. The way Rousseau d ends up describing despotism in general is that um, the commonwealth contracts until the commonwealth equals the government. So, um, um, you know, I mean, this is a little hard to understand in a monarchy or in a democracy for that matter, but if you suppose we have an aristocracy, then we can understand what he means, right? Like in a legitimate aristocracy, the uh, government consists of a few people who execute the law on behalf of the sovereign, which is everyone. But um, when the legitimate state degenerates into despotism, the, the, the state contracts until it equals just those few people who used to be the government. And now they have a legitimate state, right? That is, they're sovereign in their own little state, but everyone else is on the outside and they're like these helots. They're slaves of like basically a conquering city that has conquered them. Um, so, you know, so what Wollstonecraft is saying basically is, you know, uh, Rousseau, you know that, but you can kind of conveniently forgot about it when you started thinking about how the problems with our current, oops, oh, this hasn't been, sh I'm not paying attention, this hasn't been updating with in a long time, so you can't see the things I'm pointing to. Maybe next quarter I'm going to use a different setup. Yeah, see, well, I only wrote one. No, I wrote a couple things. I wrote Sparta and Roman Republic, and I wrote Spartans and Helots down there. Um, so that's why I kept doing this, and you didn't see me point to anything. <laughs> All right. Um, so... Uh, um, So if you had remembered that, you would really you would have realized Rousseau that the solution to this can't possibly be to eliminate this artificiality by going to something that's closer to the state of nature. Um, uh, the only you know the only thing that lies that way is barbarism. 
So, um, So the way out of this has to be get to get rid of whatever is left over from that violent barbaric stage. Um, again, you know, uh, the conclusion being that the state of true civilization, the best society, is the one that's most equal. Um, now we understand that most equal means that people will be elevated over each other by virtue. Um, Presumably, that doesn't mean that I have a card that says I'm the more virtuous, so I can tell you what to do. I would mean that something more like, if you think I'm more virtuous, you'll want to know what I think you should do, <laughs> or something like that. I think. I, it, you know, I mean, we don't have Wollstonecraft's version of the social contract. <laughs> so um, I don't know... Uh, you know, she doesn't set out in detail what this true civilization would be like. I'm trying to reconstruct it. Um, but that seems to be the idea. Okay. So the board so the board says barbarism and then it says Sparta Roman Republic, right? And what I kept saying was that um, that you know, the bad state of affairs that Wollstonecraft calls barbarism or barbaric is um, basically what Rousseau thinks happens at the end of the state of nature when it degenerates into violence. So in a way, they don't disagree that there's a stage like this between the state of nature and the beginning of civilization. But, um, but what they disagree about basically is whether there's certain exceptions whether Sparta or the Roman Republic are exceptions to this, something, a way you could come out of the state of nature, not get into this violent stage of barbarism, um, and therefore not be compelled to go forward to what we call civilization. I mean, when you do, eventually that will be unfortunate, right? And that's what the shade of Fabricius is pointing out. Like, as long as the Roman Republic kept to its virtuous constitution, as Rousseau understands it, it was it had left the state of nature, but it wasn't barbarism and it wasn't civilization. It was something better than all of those things. As soon as it um, degenerated, then it moved on into the state of civilization, and that was much worse. That was corrupt. Because, as you know, Fabricius says, it was a state of like false virtues, um, talents subverted by power, uh, something like that. Um, okay. Um, This is kind of the point where I wish I had been able to unearth evidence that Nietzsche was reading Wollstonecraft. Um, this is definitely related to Nietzsche's idea of the, the master morality being succeeded by the slave morality. The, the, right, the master morality is characterized by honesty because the noble has nothing to hide. Right, so... Um, it's not a devotion to finding out the truth wherever it's hidden. The, the masters are not interested in that at all. In fact, they're kind of stupid, according to Nietzsche, right? So, but they're devoted to truth in the sense that if you're strong and brave and what they mean by virtuous, which is strong and brave and ruling everyone else, then uh, one way you can tell that is because you have no need to lie. Right. So, but when the uh, transition happens to a stage where um, the rulers have to justify themselves before the slaves, and what character they have to do it by deception, and what one of the things that characterizes slave morality is interest in the truth in the sense of 
getting to the bottom of things because someone's trying to trick us. Um, so it would be nice to see this as a stage on the way to the way Nietzsche thinks about these things. Um, as it is, I guess the best I can do is to say, you know, they were both reading Rousseau really carefully. It's not a coincidence that they line up with each other somehow. It does not seem that, that Nietzsche, um, like I said, apparently he never mentions her in his notes or, or his printed works. Um, um, okay. So that is the stuff I wanted to say about those leftover from last time. Are there questions about that? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's This is just a comma. It doesn't say Sparta as Roman Republic. It says Sparta, comma, Roman Republic. Any more substantive questions about that? Okay, then I'm going to go on to say what I can about the new material. Um, so, um, so these chapters basically are about human nature. Um, are you going to still need this? Uh, let's see, I'll be back. Um, and in that sense, they're comparable to, say, the early chapters of Leviathan, right? Where Hobbes, before he starts to discuss how you should set up a commonwealth, has a whole discussion of um, uh, the human faculties of reason, um, of, uh, and the, the, the passions, um, the basis of knowledge, the nature of virtue and vice, right? So Wollstonecraft is talking about all of those things a lot in these chapters. Um, and, um, um, So as I already said, one of at least what I took to be the fourth of the first principles, it's not listed with the other three in the same prominent way, but what I took to be the fourth of the first principles is the best society is the one that's founded in human nature. So somewhere in these chapters there must be some hints as to what features of human nature it is that the best society is going to be founded in. Um, now, I mean... Um, you know, there's one thing we can say about that right away, which is, again, from one of the first principles, that um, um, human nature is distinguished especially by reason. So, um, so you know, therefore, somewhat paradoxically, the natural society is the one that's rationally planned or thought out. Um, whereas a traditional society that's grown up spontaneously and therefore contains these vestiges of barbarism, for example, um, is in general going to be not natural but artificial. Um, so, uh, like I said, that sounds kind of paradoxical, but actually when, um, you think about it, uh, um, really all of our authors basically agree with that, even if they wouldn't describe it that way. Um, um, they all think that a well-constituted commonwealth must be based somehow on what well, first of all they agree that it must be based on human nature somehow on facts about human nature um you know basically everyone agrees with that uh, aristotle agrees with that so <laughs> therefore everyone does and um uh <clears throat> And they agree that human nature is distinctively rational. Again, Aristotle agrees with that. The thing about human beings um, 
being uh, political animals because they are rational animals is from the beginning of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. So, um, but furthermore, they also agree with this part that Aristotle, I think, doesn't agree with, which is that um, the way that distinctive human rationality gets expressed in the natural state for human beings has to be by way of like active rational planning as to what the best state would be. Right, so um, um, so you know, so so Hobbes says that a well-constituted commonwealth comes out of people understanding the laws of nature. The laws of nature are suggestions of reason as to the means of self-preservation. So they have to think to themselves, okay, what kind of compact could we make? Um, and then they use their reason to figure out what it would be. Um, and I mean, Locke apparently also agrees with that. Rousseau sort of agrees with it, except remember, Rousseau thinks it can, this can happen by way of deception because the rational planning only has to be on the part of the legislator, that is the, the lawgiver. Right, so who then turns around and people say, okay, why should we do this? And the lawgiver says, God told me, or our God told me, the God of our city told me this is what we should do. Um, so, uh, um, so in any case, Right, so so basically, she, they they all agree with this that the the state that's in some sense natural or at least in accord with the laws of nature. I mean, Hobbes calls it artificial, right? He calls it an artificial man. He calls the laws artificial chains, but it's the state that's in accord with the law of nature, right? So if by nature, again, if by nature you mean not the state of nature, like living in the woods with acorns, but human nature insofar as it's rational, then again, Hobbes agrees that the commonwealth is the natural state for human beings. Okay, so given that she agrees with Hobbes and Locke, I guess, about this, and Rousseau, except for the lie part, which is really important, however, <laughs> um, uh, and yet um, apparently radically disagrees with Hobbes especially about what the best society would be like. Um, she must really disagree with him about what human nature is like. And this is a question in the chat. What do you mean by natural society being planned? Um, and Grant said, I think it means that it's all planned out before society even begins. Um, yeah, I mean, well, Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau do all say that it's planned out before, before a commonwealth begins. Um, at least that's the ideal way for it to happen. Um, so, um, would that be how would that be different than Locke's idea of people in in society uh, in a state of nature? Like, I guess it's not a commonwealth because they haven't agreed on it yet, but they're still. Like they're all together, but it wasn't really planned. It just kind of came out that way because of reason. Yeah. Okay. So right. I. It's true. I'm ignoring something about Locke here in comparison to the others. The way he thinks that the the law of nature that even in the state of nature people live conformable to the law of nature, sort of. Um. Uh. So does the planning mean that everyone agrees? before it's made? 
Well, everyone agrees. So, uh, you know, again, all three of them, at least as I understood it, said that the first step in forming the Commonwealth is universal consent. Everyone who's going to form the new Commonwealth has to agree that they're going to be part of it. Um, and that agreement itself is the rational plan, right? I mean, that is what happens afterwards is actually... Um, um, a contingent to cert in some ways it depends on circumstances and in some ways it doesn't matter that much right like which form you cut you choose or whatever but what matters is the that initial compact has to be the right done the right way right people have to lay down exactly the right the correct rights mutually oh I see like you yeah. have to be you can't just uh, fix it as you go along. It has to be right from the get-go or it's not going to turn out right. Yeah, and everyone has to agree. Now, I mean, having said that about all those three, I, you know, then I'm, I'm, I'm brought up short as to whether Wollstonecraft would agree with that. I mean, you know, I mean, in, oh, as I erased that thing, now I want to point to it. But, like, uh, you know... Um, Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau all agreed that in principle, the best society could arise straight out of the state of nature. Um, and um, even that that would be the best way. Um, I mean... Well, I guess, I mean, okay, you have to be careful with that. In a sense, it's true by definition that a legitimate commonwealth arises straight out of the state of nature, according to them. Because if you're already part of a commonwealth, you're not free to form one. <laughs> so you must still be in the state of nature. Um, but I guess what I meant is straight out of the original state of nature, the living in the woods state of nature, right? So, like, I mean, it could happen... In, as a result of a civil war or something like that that reduces people back to the state of nature. But it seems like all three of them, I'm not sure about Locke, but certainly Hobbes and Rousseau agree that if the Commonwealth is going to come out perfect, actually, I don't know if Hobbes agrees with this either. <laughs> Maybe it's just Rousseau. Rousseau definitely thinks that if the Commonwealth is coming out, coming out perfect, your best bet is to start with... Um, People in the savage state, I think, is what he means. Not the, not the solitary state. You couldn't get anywhere with them, right? They don't have the concepts that are necessary. Um, yeah. Having said that, I'm not even sure it's true or so. But anyway, the the. the, the, the uh, all these questions have this this characteristic. It's this is like really common in philosophy that when you, you try to make a distinction and the more you think about it, the more the distinction gets away from you. <laughs> right? Like you know, the first simple contrast you think of making, you realize, well, no, actually they're both, you know that so what is the real contrast well in any case i mean what i want to make a contrast with is that wollstonecraft thinks that the, the true civilization has to be created in a state of partial civilization at least she apparently thinks that um i mean i guess uh considering that that She's at this stage is an enthusiastic defender of the French Revolution. She doesn't think that it necessarily, maybe even possibly, comes by peaceful evolution from a state of partial civilization. Um, but on the other hand, I don't think she thinks of the French Revolution as a return to the state of barbarism or something like that. At least not now. Later she realizes maybe it could be described that way. So... Um, yeah, so for all those reasons, I feel like um, Wollstonecraft thinks you might have to do this rational planning kind of as you go. 
Um, but I don't have any hard evidence of that. And I don't know either how to explain what the difference would be there that would cause her to think that. Um, if it's really true, if she thinks that you don't have to like metaphorically raise everything to the ground before building the best structure, like why would she think that, whereas the others don't? Yeah, okay, so Vanessa said like predestination kind of way. I'm not sure at what point you asked that. Like what was predestination kind of way? Oh, okay. Um, all right, so right. So what I was starting to say before I got these these questions that make me all like make me hold my head and go mm, that means it's a really good question. <laughs> it's making me think about something. Um, all right. Um, so uh, so anyway, what I was starting to say was that if it's true that she radically disagrees with Hobbes about what the best society would be like, or the, you know, the, the best political society would be like, namely she thinks it would be the most equal, um, whereas Hobbes, of course, thinks it would be absolutely unequal. There would be a sovereign who um, isn't subject to the laws at all, and uh, the rest of us would all be subject to them. So, um, I mean, it's possible that she could think that the best political society is an absolute democracy. That would still be a disagreement with Hobbes because Hobbes thinks a monarchy is just as good or probably a little bit better. Or at least he says that to the people who is reading his book who live in a monarchy. <laughs> But um, in any case, he certainly doesn't, he doesn't give any hint of thinking that democracy is better, let alone that it's the only way to go. But I mean, it, it, you know, she could think that the best society is an absolute democracy, meaning like absolute majority rule, um, uh, as opposed to like the rule of law um, limited majority rule. Um, I doubt that's what she thinks, <laughs> but it would be consistent with saying that the best state is the most equal, but it, it doesn't say, it does not strike me as the kind of thing she would think at all. Um, okay. So anyway, so let's assume that she, re I mean, certainly she disagrees somehow. Let's assume that she agrees really radically with Hobbes about what the best political society would be like, but uh, she agrees with him that it would be based on human nature, and therefore they must disagree about what human na what the facts of human nature are. Now, um, so I said that these chapters have to contain at least part of the answer to that. Unfortunately, I mean, it's the problem I'm facing with uh, the book as a whole, but perhaps more pronouncedly in this case, that... Um, you know, unlike those early chapters of Leviathan, they're not written mostly for me to figure out what her theory of human nature is. Um, um, they're, you know, um, well, so number one, they're all about this artificial state that we live in now. Um, so she's mostly talking about the way people behave when human nature has been corrupted by bad institutions, by bad artificial institutions. So you kind of have to read between the lines to figure out what it would be like if we had good institutions. <laughs> um, but, um, but moreover, and I think this makes it harder, she's mostly talking about human beings in a very specific situation and in a very specific respect 
Ray. So um, as I said in the last lecture, like a, a lot, most of the middle of this book is about the details of the relationship between men and women in late 18th century England. Um, and, you know, it's really more specific than that. Um, it's really about the relationship between men and women of a certain class in late 18th century England, right? So you can see this, um, this comes out really clearly in some kind of side remarks she makes. These are both on page 130. Um, so page 130 is when she's, maybe I won't switch to that yet. Page 130 is when she's in the uh, midst of her kind of diatribe about um, how women are too intimate with each other and they don't have sufficient reserve and they dis they openly discuss disgusting bodily functions and whatever. I'm not even she has so much reserve that I'm not even sure which disgusting bodily functions she's talking about. <laughs> um, I mean. Uh, she claims that she's been able to discuss this type of thing with anatomists, you know, human body parts and whatever, with anatomists and with artists, and there wasn't anything immodest about it. But interestingly, she does not seem to think that the readers of her book are in that same class, because she does not want to say anything explicit. Anyway, I feel like maybe she's talking about menstruation, but I'm not sure. But in any case, um, so uh, like in the, there's definitely got to be a lot more to say about the whole cleanliness thing. And that's one of the things I wanted to work out for this lecture. And I just couldn't. Why is she so obsessed with cleanliness and um, with concealing the disgusting aspects of bodily function? But in any case, uh, th that's kind of beside the point of the, what I'm trying to say now, which is that um, you can tell from her comments in the course of this discussion what kind of women or girls she's talking about. So, for example, here she says, like I said, these are both on page 130. This is the end of the second paragraph on page 130. Many girls have learned very nasty tricks from ignorant servants. Okay, so we're talking about girls who have servants. <laughs> Not, for example, about girls who are servants, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, the same thing comes out even more clearly towards the end of the page. Um, girls ought to be taught to wash and dress alone without any distinctions of rank, right? So what that means is that... Um, you might normally think that if a girl is of sufficient rank, the servants will help her wash and dress. <laughs> but Wollstonecraft's advice is, no, you should teach them to wash and dress alone. Um, that is, without the help of the servants. So again, we're basically, she's basically giving advice to people who have servants. Um, now, I mean, uh, well, she's not unaware of this. We'll see, she makes some remarks about it later. Um, I think, you know, actually, basically, her point of view is that it's that class that's worst affected by the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, whereas, you know, lower class women are better off. Um, so that's why she says she's concentrating on it. Um, but she's also probably concentrating on the class of people who buy books. You know, that might also factor in here. Um, in any case, um, so, um, um, so focusing on the way human nature manifests itself or fails to manifest itself correctly, um, in that class, in that time and place, um, she uh, concentrates on, I guess, you know, um, 
two things that are supposed to characterize women, um, but that are really contradictory if you think about them. So the first one, and, and by the, so I say that class at that time and place, but she also, you know, I mean, it's not that limited because she also finds the same thing in Rousseau. And the second, when I finish describing these, I'll, I'll say, but maybe not in any detail, but just like, is it so limited? Is it so unlimited that it applies to us too? That's a good question. But in any case, it definitely applies to the women she's talking about. So the first thing is that they're supposed to be they're supposed to be pleasing to men. That's supposed to be their job. Right? And again, she quotes Rousseau at length saying that without any uh, apparent embarrassment about it. <laughs> Right? Like, oh, since the job of, you know, the these quotes are mostly from Emile. I think, as I mentioned last time, um, the main character, well, I mean, the main characters in Emile are Rousseau, as he imagines himself, not the real Rousseau, and this boy, Emile, who he's been given complete power over how Emile will be brought up and educated. Um, but towards the end of Emile, he t he's, you know, now it's going to be time to find Emile a wife. And so then he has a kind of digression into, and he introduces this other character, Sophia, and describes what her education has been like in order to be the perfect, um, uh, what does someone say? I don't like that. Not very, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you're not supposed to like it. <laughs> but I, but, but it's, you know, but it's worth pointing out that, that Rousseau apparently doesn't expect that people will think there's, this is scandalous. Um, um, so, uh, I mean, I don't know that Hobbes or Locke would agree with this if you asked them. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's kind of, I mean, I think Wollstonecraft thinks that it's, that it often comes out explicitly. It's not just Rousseau in the rest of chapter five, she goes on to quote other books that have been written about the education of women, which also have basically the same premise. So I think she thinks that it, it sometimes comes out explicitly, but it's, you know, but, but beyond that, it's, it really is the thought behind the way girls are being brought up. Um, Oh, sorry, Vanessa. So this this isn't this isn't what Wollstonecraft thinks. This is what people think in the society she's talking about. Okay, I I'm sorry that was unclear. She's gonna. She thinks this is ridiculous. But Rousseau bases his. Um, his plan for education of girls on this premise explicitly, right? Not just like, oh, he's unconsciously thinking that or something. He says, if you want to know how to educate girls, the first thing you have to remember is that their purpose in life is to be pleasing to men. <laughs> okay, so 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 Wilson Graf is taking that on in chapter five, but really in these other chapters too. Um, and, um, and, you know, so I put pleasing in quotes um, because pleasing is then is thought of in a relatively crude way. This is the part that people wouldn't say explicitly, maybe, but you can tell by what they're doing that they think that basically what will please men is sexual gratification. Right, so 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 girls are being trained to be attractive, basically. Um, now, I mean, um, Wollstonecraft doesn't think that that 
actually so in this again is where I wish I had time or had been able to settle this a little bit better order in my head but um, but I'll just say in the order I have it written down anyway that so I mean you know she's gonna have more than one criticism of this I mean she thinks it's intrinsically ridiculous um, but she also thinks that given the way it's understood, it's actually self-undermining that um, um, those kind of women won't please men in the end. Right? So in other words, even if you accept the premise, um, it's being understood in a way that, um, that, doesn't, that, that in the end doesn't make sense. Um, so... Uh, like here's, she said a lot of things along these lines, and she'll say more in the later chapters, as I recall. But um, um, but here's something she says in chapter six on page one twenty three. Um, uh, where is this? So, I mean, she has two different cases here, uh, you know, one of a man of abilities, a rake of abilities. Um, a rake is, I wrote down the definition that I found in Wiktionary somewhere. And I can't find it. I think they define it as something like a person, parentheses, usually a man who is stylish but accustomed to a hedonistic and um, hedonistic and something lifestyle. <laughs> anyway, so she distinguishes between a rake who's a who's a man of abilities and a rake who's not a man of abilities. Um, but uh, just concentrating on what happens to the rake who's a man of abilities. When a man of abilities is first carried away by his passions, it is necessary that sentiment and taste varnish the enormities of vice and give a zest to brutal indulgences. Right? So, in other words, the way the girls are going to be trained is to be... I mean, it's actually... Rousseau, again, says this straight out. Right? He says... Sophia is is trained to um, um, dress and behave in a way that you can't point your finger to it and say she's being seductive or something, and yet it is. <laughs> that's right. Um, so uh, that's that's what that you know. So Rousseau says that like you know you would look at her and you would say she's modestly dressed. But then your eyes wouldn't be, you know, and you are supposed to be a man here. Of course, a heterosexual man that, you know, is not under discussion. Um, for, uh, although Wollstonecraft, it's possible also in that stuff about cleanliness that, that uh, lesbianism is part of what she's worried about. I'm not sure. But in any case, for the most part, that doesn't come into discussion. So you're supposed to be a man looking at Sophia dressed in her modest dress, and you would say, boy, that's modest dress, and yet I can't take my eyes off her, and I keep going up and down her body. <laughs> that's, I, I, you know, I'm not saying this. Rousseau says this, right? So, so like, so Wollstonecraft is saying, like, that's the the girls have, have, have been trained to do because, you know, to begin with, they, you know, this brutality has to be kind of, concealed. Um, but when the gloss of novelty is worn off and pleasure pal uh, palls upon the sense, lasciviousness becomes barefaced and enjoyment only the desperate effort of weakness flying from affliction as from a legion of devils. O oh, virtue, thou art not an empty name. All that life can give, thou givest. Right, so what is that like interjection doing at the end of that paragraph? It's because what what she means is that so you know at first this will be kind of racy and exciting, but once the gloss wears off, it's going to be just like brutal satisfaction of animal appetites, 
and um, you can only take so much of that basically until it's like um, uh, um, well I just you know enjoyment becomes the desperate effort of weakness flying from reflection as from a legion of devils it becomes like an addiction like it's not really that pleasurable anymore but you keep doing it in order not to think about how brutish your life is I think that's the way she's understanding it so Right. So what she's saying is, and, and so, and the, so right after that, she says, Oh, virtue, you know, thou art not an empty name, meaning like, um, again, an agreement with Hobbes, virtue is the actual way to, um, um, to, the, to a pleasant life. There isn't any other way. Right? All that life can give, thou givest. So if you think there's a shortcut, and a shortcut by way of making my life pleasant, and I don't worry about other people's life, or something like that, then in the end it's going gonna, it's gonna to bite me back. Right? My life is going to be unpleasurable too. And... Um, um, and it's going to end up with that the only thing these sensible sensual pleasures are gaining me and now you know like i mean the specific things she's saying about men and women of course are very important and the whole book is very important for that reason but in this context i'm trying to abstract from that a little bit to get out her general view about human nature and so i think you could say whether it's sex or or any other kind of right if you think that if I think that by getting all the acorns and no one else having the acorns, I can live a pleasurable life, in the end I'm going to be sick of acorns and I'm going to keep eating them just because I don't want to think about what a nasty life I have. <laughs> um, um, so, um, so this is an, actually an important theme with her. and I mean, it's an important attribute of the version of feminism she's trying to, to found and push forward, but it, I think it generalizes presumably to her political views in general, That and it's actually something she shares with Rousseau, um, namely that inequality and, in, and injustice are ultimately bad for both parties. Right. In fact, in that quote that I read from Rousseau before, we saw him having Fabricius say that to the Romans. Right. He said, get rid of these slaves who actually subject you. Um, and he, he's, he said that in other places, too, when he when he discusses the beginning of society and how the rich trick the poor into obeying them or whatever. He said, you know, he says that's how this situation started, where everyone is dependent on someone else who has power over them. The rich also, not just the poor, right? They become dependent on getting other people to obey them. So, I mean, I don't think uh, that they're saying that it's just as bad to be a master as it is to be a slave, or in Wollstonecraft's case, that it's just as bad to be a man in 18th century England as it is to be a woman in 18th century England. But, um, but they are saying that the master or the man would be better off out of this situation. It's not really benefiting them. Okay, in any case, that was all kind of a long digression. Um, um, right, I mean, you know, so like, one more thing about that digression. This has to be true if you can appeal to reason in this situation. It might also have, have some bearing on that other question before. Does this planning all have to be done in advance or can it be done as we go? Right? That, like, 
if only you can somehow get education going better so that men and women are more rational, or that you can start making the arguments to them, to both of them, that things would be better another way. And then that will lead to a further in, um, improvement in education and so forth. You might hope that that could happen, right? Whereas if you think um, that, um, uh, that the result of this demand is that men really do have a lot of pleasure and they're going to they're gonna have to give it up, then it's going to be much harder to do this by appealing to reason. Um, um, I guess it depends partly on, on something I'm... I'm still not sure about what she thinks the relationship between virtue and self-interest really is. Um, but like certainly if she went all the way with Hobbes um, and Locke and said that the, you know, the way reason convinces people to be virtuous is by con just by convincing them that they'd be better off virtuous than not. It's in their self-interest then, of course, if you were to concede that this situation really is good for men, you would not be able to convince them that it's in their best interest to end it. So uh, um, you would have to reduce everything to the state of nature again, somehow, probably violently, right? Deprive, deprive everyone of, the, of whatever unjust privileges they have, and then you could make the right compact, maybe, right? Because because then you you know you say okay now you don't have anything, solitary, nasty, brutish, and short. I have a compact for you, <laughs> right? So in any case, uh, that was an even longer digression. Um, this was all the first thing, the first demand that's made on women in this society she's talking about, and um, at least to some extent in our society. And then, um, although few people would come out and say this explicitly, I think. Well, maybe in some nasty corners of the internet, <laughs> people are saying this, but anyway. So the other one is, that women are supposed to be modest. Now, I mean, the whole topic of chapter, chapter seven, right? Yeah, the whole topic of chapter seven is modesty. And it's very confusing because she's talking about different, she's talking both about what would, what leads to modesty, what makes modesty good, but also what is the true meaning of modesty and what is a false understanding of modesty. Um, so, um, but, so that's part of why, I, just like pleasing, I put modest in quotation marks. She doesn't think that what women are being asked to do in her society is actually being modest. Um, you know, one of the things she says about it is modesty is a virtue and therefore it has to be based on knowledge. So, and also it has, we have to desire it for its own sake. Whereas instead what's going on in her society is that women are being told to preserve a certain reputation. Um, and, um, and they're being told to preserve that reputation because uh, otherwise they'll be ruined and they won't be suitable for marriage. Right? So, um, um, but, so I guess when I said there's a contradiction between these two things, there isn't a contradiction between these two things if you keep all the quotation marks on. But if you take modestly, at least, if you take this part seriously, then uh, Wollstonecraft says, well, this is just ridiculous on the face of it. Um, and 
This is on page 129. Where indeed could modest women find husbands from whom they would not continually turn with disgust? Right? That's the contradiction. On the one hand, they're supposed to be preparing themselves to please these men who are only interested in sex. <laughs> um, right? They're not even interested in having children. That's something Wollstonecraft emphasizes a lot, right? Like, these girls are not being trained to be good mothers. You would have to train them very differently for that. So they're, so they're being, they're, 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 they're supposed to prepare they're supposed to be preparing to please these men who are the very opposite of modest, at least in, a, in any serious sense of modest. And so, therefore, she adds, modesty must be equally cultivated by both sexes, or it will ever remain a sickly house, hothouse plant, while the, with the affection of it, the fig leaf borrowed by wantonness may give a zest to voluptuous enjoyments. Um, right? So she's saying, like, in our situation where the men are not expected to be modest. Now, I mean, I haven't defined modest. <laughs> it's kind of being defined in context. Um, but more needs to be said about it. And again, it's hard to say more about it because she's playing with both false meanings of it and true meanings of it as she goes through this chapter. Um, but, um, um, but certainly, like, um, a modest person who was modest in the, her favored sense, one thing she says about them is that they would be steady. Um, um, yeah, this is on page 125 at the top. Modest man is steady, and humble man timid, and humble man timid, and a vain one presumptuous. This is the judgment which the observation of many characters has led me to perform. Then she adds this thing about Jesus, Moses, and Peter. I don't know what to do with that. But um, so, uh, uh, right, that this is a contrast between modesty, true modesty, and mere humility. Humility is like a kind of timidity, like you're afraid to go forward because you're insecure about yourself. Modesty means you're confident in yourself and you're steady and you know what you can do and what you can't and you do the right thing. Now, so, I mean, that sense of modesty at first seems completely unconnected to this sexual sense of modesty she's talking about, right? Where like modesty might mean wearing a dress that covers your knees or something like that. Like, I mean, this that kind of modesty is the kind she's talking about when she says George Washington was known as a modest man, um, right? And she says if he had been humble, he would have turned down the, um, when they asked him to be the head of the American forces, he would have turned them down because we said, I can't do that. That's, I, that is what Moses tries to do when God calls on him too. <laughs> um, I guess she's thinking of that, but um, but because he was modest, he was like, okay, I'll do my best, you know, <laughs> whatever, and he followed through on it steadily. Um, so, but again, how is this related to this idea of sexual modesty? Um, um, I think she's thinking again that if you're rational and you know things about human nature and you understand um, how long this kind of sexual uh, charm is going to last versus um, how long it's going to take to have a household and children and all those things that are much more important, 
you'll say to yourself, wow, that's, you know, I don't really want that. So that is, I think that's the connection between true modesty in a general, in her mind, between true modesty in a general sense and true sexual modesty. The true sexual modesty means like, um, um, you're not trying to get this great romantic like sexual adventure because you know that um, that won't last very long and or and if you tried to keep it up it would be that case where she says where you know you get sick of it basically um, so um, well, I see, even though I was worried that I didn't have enough to say, that I'm out of time before I get to the important part. <laughs> so, I'll, so I'll definitely talk about this at the beginning next time. Um, but, um, but in any case, um, yeah, what I have to talk about next time, I mean, it's, it's starting to come out, but what I have to say more about next time is what you can say about, like, the general relationship between those three important things she mentioned at the beginning, virtue, reason, virtue, and knowledge, about how those things go together due to facts about human nature. Um, the, you know, like what is the, the general truth of which this is just an application? Um, and that in turn should help us understand what she disagrees with Hobbes about. So, yeah, hopefully I'll have more to say about that on Tuesday, and uh, see you then.